Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Hey, Shabbat Shalom, and welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard. My name is Adam, and I welcome you. This is our Torah portion reading. Uh, we're actually going to finish up Leviticus today. We're going to be covering Leviticus 21 through 27, finishing the book, and really excited to uh, to do so. Uh, haven't been uh, We haven't done the Torah portions the last few weeks because we were camping out in the wilderness of Lebanon, praise the Most High, celebrating the Feast of Sukkot, and it was... An amazing time. Uh, just so much to talk about, but for another time, but just know that we had an amazing time and uh, yeah, hallelujah. And so uh, anyways, uh, so we're going to catch up and kind of finish up uh, Leviticus um, and uh, yeah, finish up. So let's start with some prayer and uh, I've got the shofar here, hallelujah, and uh, we'll get started with the door portion. So Heavenly Father, Yahweh Most High, we, we bless you and we praise you. Thank you for sending your son, Yahusha HaMashiach. Father, thank you for grabbing hold of our lives. And thank you for not letting us die in our sins, O Yahweh, and drawing us unto your son and drawing us unto your word, to truth, showing us the falsehoods of this world, Father, and revealing your truth. Thank you for your Sabbaths, your feast days. Thank you for uh, giving us right ruling and instruction. Father, we ask that your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, would be with us as we study your word, only that we may understand you better, your character, what what you're asking of us, and how to walk out the Torah with all of our heart, soul, and mind. We love you, and we bless you, and it's your Son, Yahushua's name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. So, uh, let's blow the shofar. Get your shofar ready. <clears throat> and uh, we'll blow over here. Praise God. Hallelujah. A weapon of warfare and a musical instrument. So we're going to be covering again Leviticus 21 through 27. So this is weeks 31, 32, and 33. Uh, So let's get right into it because, of course, we're going to have a lot to discuss. And uh, so here we are, Leviticus 21. And uh, what we'll do is we'll let the the word audio play. So we'll listen to all of Leviticus 21. Then we'll Sit down. We'll we'll discuss uh, some of the things that need to be uh, <clears throat> need to be discussed. So praise God. Let's listen in Leviticus twenty one. Praise God. Vaikra, Leviticus chapter twenty one. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, Speak unto the priests, the sons of Aharon, and say unto them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people, but for his kin that is near unto him, that is, for his mother, and for his father, and for his son, and for his daughter, and for his brother, and for his sister a virgin, that is nigh unto him, which has had no man, for her may he be defiled. But he shall not defile himself, being a chief among his people, to profane himself. They shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corners of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy unto their Elohim, and not profane the name of their Elohim. For the offerings of Yahuwah made by fire, and the bread of their Elohim they do offer. Therefore they shall be holy. They shall not take a woman that is a whore, or profane. Neither shall they take a woman put away from her man, for he is holy unto his Elohim. You shall sanctify him therefore, for he offers the bread of your Elohim. He shall be holy unto you, for I, Yahuwah, which sanctify you, am holy. And the daughter of any priest, if she profane herself by playing the whore, she profanes her father, she shall be burnt with fire. 
and he that is high priest among his brethren, upon whose head the anointing oil was poured, and that is consecrated to put on the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor rend his clothes. Neither shall he go in to any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or for his mother. Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his Elohim, for the crown of the anointing oil of his Elohim is upon him. I am Yahuwah. And he shall take a woman in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman, or profane or a harlot, these shall he not take, but he shall take a virgin of his own people to be his woman. Neither shall he profane his seed among his people, for I, Yahuwah, do sanctify him. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto El Aharon, saying, Whosoever he be of your seed in their generations, that has any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his Elohim. For whosoever man he be that has a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame, or he that has a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crook-backed, or a dwarf, or that has a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or has his stones broken. No man that has a blemish of the seed of Aharon the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of Yahuwah made by fire. He has a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his Elohim. He shall not eat the bread of his Elohim, both of the Most Holy and of the Holy. Only he shall not go in unto the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he has a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, for I, Yahuwah, do sanctify them. And Moshe told it unto El Aharon, and to his sons, and to all the children of Yashrael. Praise, yeah. So here we have instructions for uh, the high priest. And we know that Yahushua said that, uh, he said, Moses wrote of me. And so we know that, uh, of course, the details of who Messiah would be, all those things were hidden in the, the scriptures, in the Torah, but specifically about his his priesthood and how he would be unblemished. Uh, and obviously, I think these things were setting up for a perfect, uh, you know, prophesying, if you will, of a perfect uh, high priest to come, and which is Messiah Yahusha. At least that's the the testimony that I have is that he has come and he is the the perfect one. He is the high priest. He is our king. Uh, he is the one that we follow. So, but also a reminder, <clears throat> we can't forget that we are called to be a, a holy priesthood as well. So Messiah is the high priest, but he has many priests under him. Uh, I don't know what just happened. These ads, okay. So uh, 1 Peter 2.5, uh, Peter's reminding us, you also as lively or living stones are built of a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Elohim by Yahusha HaMashiach. So he's like the high priest. It's like, it's it, what it seems is like, is like we offer it and then he like presents it before the father uh, or or just, you know, the, 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 the prayers come in his name and then of course are offered before the most high. But nevertheless, the, the point here is, we are called a holy priesthood. So we may just read through this and be like, oh, yeah, well, that doesn't apply to any of us. But there's obviously some spiritual <clears throat> some spiritual lessons to be had here. Obviously, the, the priest was to take great care in, in selecting uh, his wife. Uh, and so it should some of those, you know, some of those precepts apply today? Well, of course, I would say so. I would argue yes. And uh, Exodus 19, 5 through 6, this is no uh, new concept here. It says, now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, so basically keep the commandments, cause and effect, then, so effect, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So this is not a new concept about his people being a kingdom of priests. <clears throat> and then it's solidified at the end of the book, Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sung a new song saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and have redeemed us of the Elohim by your blood out of every kindred and tongue, people, and nation, and has made us unto our Elohim kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So, um, hey, if... if um, 
It may not be manifest right now that we are kings and priests in the fleshly or in the physical, uh, but that will manifest in the physical uh, one day. But in the spiritual, uh, can we not be acting as priests as uh, you know? First Peter two five indicates that we're supposed to offering up these spiritual sacrifices, supplicating for all the saints, like Ephesians six tells us to, uh, praying over, laying on of hands. Um, you know, these are the things the priests uh, were to take part in, and uh, <clears throat> so. With that being said, I, I want to share a passage um, from the writings of Abraham. Uh, those of you that were with us uh, when we were going through Genesis, we we uh, reference this quite often. And uh, just a reminder, this is not the book of Abraham, which is in the Book of Mormon. This has nothing to do with it. It's a completely different writing. There's no association. The only association there is is they share the name Abraham. Uh, but this is called the Writings of Abraham. This is different, uh, different writing. Test it for yourself. I really do p- hope it's. Well, I hope I hope that one day I can do a line by line on this uh, this book. But um, even if you're skeptical, you can just listen in. And uh, this we'll start with Hebrews twelve twenty three to the General Assembly and Assembly Church of the Firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to Elohim the Judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Yahusha the Mediator of the New Covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than of Abel. So here's let's go to uh, <clears throat> chapter ninety seven of the Writings of Abraham in in regards to this priesthood. Um, yeah, this is some of the most information we get about the Melchizedek priesthood, because, you know, even in the book of Hebrews, Paul, who I think is the writer, is like, hey, I want to I want to tell you more about Melchizedek, but it's like, you, you have, you keep needing to have to go back to the milk, you know, um, I want to teach you these, these greater things, but he, he didn't even go on to teach it. So I, I think this is where uh, a lot of the Melchizedek order information is, uh, has been preserved. And, um, is available if someone you know wants to research it and read it, and it's still hidden for for most. And when I had done this, Melchizedek again lifted up his voice and blessed me, saying, "Blessed are you, Abraham, for the Most High Elohim shall visit you, and shall bestow upon you riches and honor and lands for an everlasting possession, because you have been true and faithful to the covenants which you have entered before him." This is the same test before all of us today. Wherefore, so because of this, you shall continue to increase worlds without end, and the glory of Yahweh shall never depart from you. The blessing of your father shall rest upon you, and you shall stand at the head in and in you, and in your seat after you. Those who shall bear your priesthood shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so uh, Abraham was carrying the Melchizedek priesthood, the order, and uh, we know that that got paused or separated, if you will, at, at the uh, the with the uh, sons of Jacob. We know the right of the firstborn went to um, uh, Joseph. We know that the priesthood went to Levi and the kingship to Judah, which where we see in a Melchizedek priesthood, it's a king and priest like Yahushua is. And so, anyways, uh, let's keep going. Chapter 98, Therewith I departed from Melchizedek, rejoicing in his blessing, for he was a man of faith who wrought righteousness and when a child, he feared Elohim, and by his faith, he stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire when those of the evil combination sought to destroy him from off the face of the earth. Therefore, having been approved of Elohim, he was ordained a high priest after the order of the covenant which Elohim made with Enoch, which is after the order of the firstborn, even our father Adam. For this holy order came not by man, nor by the will of man, neither by father nor mother, neither by beginning of days nor end of years, but of Elohim. And this is what I believe that Paul is quoting in regards to the office of Melchizedek. Um, The way it's positioned in Hebrews makes it seem like um, Melchizedek had no earthly mother or father, but that's actually... I don't think that's correct. I think this is the uh, this is what he was quoting and, and drawing from. Uh, you know, spelled out a little more plainly, a little more easier to understand. Um, For it was established in the beginning of the earth by the ancient of days. Wherefore it is called the order of the ancients, and it was delivered unto men from the beginning by the calling of Elohim's own voice, according to his own will, through the voice of his priesthood, unto as many as believed on his name and were faithful until they had obtained. Behold, these could transcend the veil according to the will of Elohim and commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn in heaven, and many were caught up to be with him. For Elohim had sworn unto Enoch and unto his seed with an oath by himself that every one being ordained after this order and calling should have power by faith to break mountains, to divide the seas, 
to dry up waters, to turn them out of their course, to put at defiance the armies of nations, to divide the earth, to break every band, to stand in the presence of Elohim, to do all things according to his will, according to his command, subdue principalities and powers, and by this, by the will of the Son of the only begotten of the Father, which was from before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. And men having this faith and coming up into this order of Elohim could be translated and taken up into heaven. Now Melchizedek was a priest after this order, which is the holy order of Elohim. Therefore he obtained peace and shalom and was called the Prince of Peace. And his people wrought righteousness and obtained heaven, for they sought for the city of Enoch, which Elohim had before taken, New Jerusalem, separating it from the earth, having reserved it unto the latter days or the end of the world. For Elohim had sworn, had said and sworn with an oath that the heavens and the earth should come together again and the sons of Elohim be tried even by fire. So if you're wondering why, why you, why always you, um, why are you continuing to be tested all the time? Well, this is what it is. Elohim had sworn with an oath that the heavens and the earth should come together again and the sons of Elohim be tried even by fire. And thus Melchizedek, having established righteousness, was, was called the king of heaven by his people, or in other words, king of peace. And they communed with those in the city of Enoch and in the city of Peleg and had access to them and were blessed all their days. That's the writings of Abraham, 97, 1 through 100, 100 uh, verse 5. So this is the ancient Melchizedek priesthood order is actually the ancient order that Yahushua came to restore and to inaugurate. And uh, we are to be priests uh, under him in those things in regards to spiritual sacrifices, which of course we've been talking all throughout Leviticus and we'll continue to uh, with the Torah portion. The other thing about Leviticus 21 I want to mention in regards to priests is there there's a, a great deal of attention here in regards to taking a wife and how many instructions there are in regards to taking a wife and, and, and how serious the matter is. And so while, you know, while, while we may not be the high priest, because this is in regards to the high priest uh, and consider Messiah, Husha is uh, the high priest and he's the one that's supposed to take great care in selecting his wife. Um, you know, I know there's different interpretations. I believe that Yah's people have always been uh, mar uh, married to Yahusha, the son uh, and Matthew 22 spells it out. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a uh, king that made a wedding for his son. <clears throat> and then it goes on to explain how the Israelites were supposed to go to the wedding, but they weren't worthy. And then the cities were burned up, 70 AD. And then, of course, the, the new renewed call for the wedding. Uh, and so Yahusha is taking a spotless bride, uh, one in her virginity. And so, obviously, uh, you know what? I don't, I don't think I have this... Um, on the the list here but let's put this here uh, i think it's colossians one is it colossians one uh, oops yeah here we go <clears throat> Colossians 1, 21, and you that were sometimes alienated alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, uh, which in my opinion is what we see spiritually here in Revelation 14. Uh, we see uh, Revelation 14, 4, these are they which are not defiled with women, uh, specifically the harlot, um, Babylon, Jerusalem, uh, Judaism, and all its ways and all its tentacles. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever he goes. So literally, these people do everything he does. And it, it can be simply put as this. Some people ask, you know, what, what do you do? What do you follow? I just follow Messiah. You know, uh, he kept the commandments, so so do I. Um, so so will I do with all my heart. Uh, you know, he wore zit seat, so will I. He kept the feast days, so will I. He kept the Sabbath, so will I. He kept clean dietary laws, so will I. Uh, he cared for the poor, so will we. He, he laid hands on the sick, so will we. Uh, he... Um, all the other stuff, right? Hallelujah. Uh, and so I'm getting a little off topic here, but getting back to it, you know, the high priest is take, to take great care in selecting uh, a wife, one in her virginity, uh, not profane, uh, not, you know, wicked, you know. And so obviously, uh, <laughs> if we want to be that bride, for us men, this seems really, really weird concept, but we'll just go with it and we're going to trust Yah that this is, that we're supposed to be pure like a bride. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> but I also want to say in a very, very physical sense and a very um, 
yeah, in a physical sense, you know, selecting a wife for us now, men, um, should be also taken with great care. Um, and there's a passage from the book of the Nazarene that I really want to, would like to read here. It's, uh, let's see, the book of the Nazarene, chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. It's about selecting a wife, but also about instructing uh, his children in Torah. So it says, if a man fails to instruct his, his children or permit them to grow up unruly, he is a transgressor against the Torah. And is it not obvious this affects the children? Now listen to this. If a man chooses his wife for her beauty and charm because she pleases him, so really just choosing according to your eyes, and not for her wifely and motherly attributes, right? Not going for the inside. He transgresses against the Torah. Does not the effect of this fall upon his children? If a man steal, Elohim will not chastise his children. But if that man be caught and crucified, his wife sold into bondage, will not this will not his children suffer? Going so the point is made here. The, you know we we should be choosing, selecting after the heart, not after the eyes. We we should be people molded into the image of Yahuwah, uh, into the image of his son, excuse me, uh, Yahusha. And let's not forget that um, um, when when Yahuwah was selecting a king, remember Samuel was like, ah, oh, surely this is the one. He's like, nah, I don't judge. I don't judge, um, you know, after the eyes. I don't see as man sees, but he sees in the inner, the inner part. So likewise, you know, when selecting a husband or, or wife, you know, we should be looking for the inner man, the inner woman, and not just the outside. Should, should we be attracted to our, our spouse? Of course. Uh, but really, this is what we should be looking for, the inside. Uh, and uh, Anyway, so that's the point being made. I want to read the rest, these last two verses, because um, really it's so, so important. The Torah of Yahuwah, as given in the books of wisdom, is unlike the laws of men. A man is responsible not only for what he does, but what for what he fails to do. And though he spends his whole life in prayer... At places of righteousness, but overlooks his obligation under the greater Torah, he is not free of transgression. And this verse is so relevant to our day. I, I Being in this movement for some time, I've seen loads of people that forsake all sorts of earthly duties, parenting, um, loving their neighbor, uh, just basic responsibilities of life. To, to show how much they're studying and how much they're 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 serving Yah, but they're foregoing like basic things. This is why Paul says, you know, if a man does not work, he does not eat. If a man does not provide for his uh, house, he's worse than an unbeliever. And so we have to balance this. Uh, and the reason I say this is because I've seen tons of, I've seen quite a few people in this movement that that do this, that do this right here. They think that they're doing right by just praising Yah all day and reading the scriptures all day, but foregoing their responsibilities, right? It says he is not free of transgression. The deeds of men are like pebbles thrown into a pool, sending out ever-widening ripples. And I assure you that all harm done by the ripples shall be counted against he who caused them, no matter how far distant it occurs. This is the Torah. Whatever a man transmits to his children, even down to the 10th generation, that shall be accounted against him. Likewise, if a man fails to do things he should for his children, that too will not be overlooked. When the day of assessment comes, there's no hiding. It will be like a net cast into the sea, which gathers up every kind of fish, some wholesome and others not. When full, it is drawn to shore, and the wholesome fish are placed in baskets while the unwholesome are thrown aside. So it is at the time of assessment. The good go in one direction and the transgressors in another. Hallelujah. Uh, let's see. What else here? I think that's all we have for 21, and uh, let's go on to 22. We have lots to cover, of course, today. We've got uh, quite a few more chapters. So let's go on to chapter 22. Vaikra, Leviticus, chapter 22. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto El Aharon and to his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Yasharel, and that they profane not my holy name in those things, which they hallow unto me. I am Yahuwah. Say unto them, Whosoever he be of all your seed among your generations, that goes unto the holy things, which the children of Yasharel hallow unto Yahuwah, having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from my presence. I am Yahuwah. What man soever of the seed of Haron is a leper, 
or has a running issue, he shall not eat of the holy things until he be clean. And whoso touches anything that is unclean by the dead, or a man whose seed goes from him, or whosoever touches any creeping thing whereby he may be made unclean, or a man of whom he may take uncleanness, whatsoever uncleanness he has, the soul which has touched any such thing shall be unclean until evening, and shall not eat of the holy things, unless he wash his flesh with water. And when the sun is down, he shall be clean, and shall afterward eat of the holy things, because it is his food. That which dies of itself, or is torn with beasts, he shall not eat to defile himself therewith. I am Yahuwah. They shall therefore guard my ordinance, lest they bear sin for it, and die therefore. If they profane it, I, Yahuwah, do sanctify them. There shall no stranger eat of the holy thing. A sojourner of the priest or a hired servant shall not eat of the holy thing. But if the priest buy any soul with his money, he shall eat of it. And he that is born in his house, they shall eat of his meat. If the priest's daughter also be married unto a stranger, she may not eat of an offering of the holy things. But if the priest's daughter be a widow or divorced and have no child, and is returned unto her father's house as in her youth, she shall eat of her father's meat, but there shall no stranger eat thereof. And if a man eat of the holy thing unwittingly, then he shall put the fifth part thereof unto it, and shall give it unto the priest with the holy thing. And they shall not profane the holy things of the children of Yasharel, which they offer unto Yahuwah, or suffer them to bear the iniquity of trespass when they eat their holy things. For I, Yahuwah, do sanctify them. And Yahuwah spoke unto El Moshe, saying, Speak unto El Aharon, and to his sons, and unto all the children of Yasharel, and say unto them, Whatsoever he be of the house of Yasharel, or of the strangers in Yasharel, that will offer his oblation for all his vows, and for all his freewill offerings, which they will offer unto Yahuwah for a burnt offering, ye shall offer at your own will a male without blemish, of the cattle, of the sheep, or of the goats. But whatsoever has a blemish, that shall ye not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. And whosoever offers a sacrifice of peace offerings unto Yahuwah to accomplish his vow, or a freewill offering in cattle or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. Blind or broken or maimed or having a running sore or scurvy or scabbed, ye shall not offer these unto Yahuwah, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto Yahuwah. Either a bullock or a lamb that has anything superfluous or lacking in his parts that may you offer for a freewill offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. Ye shall not offer unto Yahuwah that which is bruised or crushed or broken or cut, neither shall ye make any offerings thereof in your land. Neither from a stranger's hand shall ye offer the bread of your Elohim of any of these, because their corruption is in them, and blemishes be in them. They shall not be accepted for you. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, When a bullock or a sheep or a goat is brought forth, then it shall be seven days under the dam, and from the eighth day and thenceforth it shall be accepted for an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. And whether it be cow or ewe, ye shall not kill it and her young, both in one day. And when ye offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving unto Yahuwah, offer it at your own will. On the same day it shall be eaten up. Ye shall leave none of it until the morrow. I am Yahuwah. Therefore shall ye guard my commandments and do them. I am Yahuwah. Neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Yasharel. I am Yahuwah, which hallow you, that brought you out of the land of Misraim to be your Elohim. I am Yahuwah. All right, praise yeah, Leviticus 22. Let's talk about a few things here. Obviously, uh, it should be st sticking out here about this perfect offering. Uh, at least to me, it... Um, it just reminds me of, of Yahusha's perfection, and, um, and so just hallelujah, hallelujah for that. I, I meant to share earlier when we were talking about uh, 
Yahusha selecting a, a uh, spotless bride, the, the virgin bride. Uh, also, I just want to remind us of Revelation 19. And uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's start at... Let's start at verse 6. I just can only imagine what this would sound like, and I really want to be here for this. It says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying... Hallelujah. For Yahweh Elohim omnipotent reigns. The reason I say this is because when we get together, like at the feast days, um, we'll have like, I don't know, four, five, six hundred people all saying it at the same time, and it is just thunderous. And so I can just, I can only imagine what that will be like with hundreds of thousands, millions, uh, whatever his, his, his number is, <laughs> whatever the number is. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, the set-apart ones. And uh, we can't forget, we'll obviously cover this when we get into Deuteronomy, we can't forget that a clear-cut definition of righteousness, it says, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before Yahweh Elohim, as he has commanded us. And we also have to remember in the New Testament, um, uh, first John, he, John reminds us this. He says, uh, little children, first John three, seven, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. And then he goes on to say, he that commits the sin, commits sin is of the devil. And so obviously we know this is talking about, you know, righteousness, we know sin is transgression of the Torah, which is clear right here. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law of the Torah, for sin is transgression of the Torah. And so John is letting us know, hey, there's no, make no mistake about it. Uh, don't let anyone confuse you. Those of you who practice righteousness, who, who walk in it, you are righteous. So hallelujah. Um, this is not some self-righteousness. It's interesting that people that accuse people of walking in the law, um, which is defined as righteousness, as self-righteousness, are actually the ones that are self-righteous themselves because, well, they're not walking in righteousness and they're claiming it by just saying, you know, Yahushua is my righteousness. Um, and I think that's a little self-righteous. But anyways, we we should pray for them and and not um, talk, speak ill of them or, or whatnot. So it's just interesting because I found... In my travels, in my in my walk here, that most people who go around calling everyone narcissists are actually narcissists themselves. Uh, people who go around accusing people of all these things are typically guilty of the thing these things themselves. Um, and so uh, I know I know the world calls it projecting, um, but uh, in a lot of ways, the end of that the end of that sinful, disastrous process is called um, he who digs a pit for others to fall in it will fall in it himself. And um, yeah. All right. So let's get back on topic here. Leviticus 22. Uh, just a couple of things to point out. I, I just want to mention this is not for ar not for argument's sake, just because we're going through the Torah portion. And when I, when I point out only because I know people love talking about this evening to evening versus uh, morning to morning topic, and just one of the things that always was peculiar to me when this subject is talk is discussed is is it why is it when the sun goes down someone is clean? We see this all throughout the scriptures, of course. Um, you know, in my mind, it makes sense to me. And maybe this could be confirmation bias. Yeah, sure. Um, to me, it makes sense that okay, when the sun goes down, he's clean because the new day has started. The next day has started instead of the opposite, which would be well, half the day is over and the second half of the day started now. So I don't know, just just to me, just for discussion's sake, um, uh, don't make a big deal out of it. Uh, so, so let's go to verse uh, 16. It's talking about the, the eating of the holy things, which was, was commanded for the priests. Um, and just consider that, remember that, that part of the reward of eternal life is that we get to eat something. <laughs> Revelation 22, 1 through 4, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 
and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Hallelujah. Also, Revelation 22, 14 through 15 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments. They may have the right to the tree of life, so they may have the right to eat this thing, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and makes a lie. Which is not the place we want to be in, brethren. Um, obviously, the acceptable offerings, it's speaking of the the perfection of the uh, the offering without blemish. Um, and just remember, just a reminder, that we are to be living sacrifices also without blemish. Romans 12, 1 through 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Elohim, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. And so this is obviously not like just laying down an altar and be like, I'm yours. Obviously, this is talking uh, spiritual, metaphorical, um, uh, I don't know, all the different ways. Obviously, this should encompass our entire life. Uh, our, our what we do, what we think, how we breathe, uh, how we do everything, uh, how we do every facet of life, we should be making sure we're doing it in accordance of his Torah, which means to be set apart, different, acceptable unto Elohim, which is your reasonable service. I mean, I don't, I don't know about you. I deserve, with the, the actions that I lived and the way I lived, I deserve utter, utter torment and death and chaos for the rest of my life because of the way I lived my life. Some of you, of course, uh, I'm sure lived uh, also in decent lives to varying degrees. It doesn't matter. Uh, we've all fallen short. So I love this verse. So it's like, it's your reasonable service. So it's like, oh yeah, uh, since I should be completely dead and annihilated in hell, um, in the lake of fire, hey, it's pretty reasonable for me to give you every ounce of my service of my life uh, for the rest of my days. And that doesn't, and consider that doesn't have to be mean that you're in ministry to give you every part of your life. I mean, that can be many facets of your life that you just give him everything that you have. And he also, the scriptures also says, whatever you do, do it like you're doing it unto Yahuwah. So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of Elohim. James 1, 25 through 27, but who looks into the perfect Torah, the law of liberty, of freedom, and continues in it, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before Elohim and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Remember, uh, we were just talking earlier about the, the clean, fine white linen. Uh, well, if, we're, if we are given garments of, uh, by, you know, spiritual garments by Yahushua, well, we better keep this unspotted from the world. I'm talking to myself too. This is not, uh, you know, <clears throat> high and mighty talk. So uh, we already talked about what I wanted to and here, just a reminder, 1 John 3, 4, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. So this is a biblical definition for sin is the transgression of the law. Boom. I don't know why I just said boom. That was totally unnecessary. I meant to say like period, like, sorry for the ridiculous dramatic effect. Um, and then verse 6, whoever lives in him sins not. Whoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. This is not like Oh, since you've ever messed up in your life, uh, you've not seen him, you know, you don't know him, you're out. That's not what it's saying. But with this renewed mindset, because it starts off, we are the sons of Elohim. So this is indicating that this is addressing those who are walking in the way in faith and obedience. And obviously it's that obedience is being defined here. So whoever lives in him sins not. So this isn't, this isn't. The old, the old uh, way of teaching, like, oh, you know, I sin today, I sin tomorrow, we're all going to sin, just can't stop sinning. Like, that's not okay. Like, that's not okay behavior in Yahweh's house. Now, whether any of us are going to attain perfection in this lifetime or not, only Yahweh knows, uh, and I'm certainly not there, but I want to strive for it. That's what I, that's the goal of what I want to work towards. And then it says again, remember, little, little children, let no, no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, not sinning, 
The son of Elohim was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil, destroy sin, and get out of his people's lives and get it out of their hearts, right? Um, and then last thing on 22, um, it's talking about here, um, it says uh, Leviticus 22, 27, when a bullock or a sheep or a goat is brought forth, then it shall be seven days under its dam, and from the eighth day and thenceforth it shall be accepted for an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah, and whether it be a cow or you, you shall not kill it and her young both in one day. So, uh, you know, pretty, I can understand that. Um, I don't know. I, who would want to do that? Who would want to kill the cow and the young in one day? And, um, but I believe this is the, I believe this is the, um, basis for um, um, you should not kill a, a, a kid in its mother's milk. Uh, I think this is what it's talking. I think this is the reference for it. I don't believe it's talking about you can't eat meat and cheese together like a uh, certain religion uh, defines the scripture as, but I believe this is the the, the basis for uh, you shall not uh, ha, you know see a, a kid in its mother's milk, right? Okay, and I th yeah, that's it for 22. Let's move on to 23, which this is really the big, uh, chapter 23 is really the, the big part uh, of this, um, well, combined Torah portion. I've got a couple Torah portions together. Um, so doing the feasts, in my opinion, you know, is one of the biggest things that we can do uh, in these last days. And it really, it really, uh, it's, it's hard to see a group of people within this movement rising up and just, you know, now just, you know, really just kind of yelling at people to stop keeping the feast. You're profaning it. You're keeping it a profane land and all this stuff, which we'll talk about here in a second. But I'm, I'm here to tell you as a witness, uh, I believe with all my heart that Yahweh Most High um, is is pleased with our attempts uh, to keep his feast the best we can with whatever the calendar that we're currently uh, convinced uh, in, in our mind about, um, regardless of where we're at. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about that in a second. So, uh, very, I'll tell you, keeping the feast days has been such an, an amazing part of this walk. And uh, if you haven't participated in these yet, wow, I, I would just really encourage you to. It's just such a big part of this. And, uh, you know, each feast points towards Messiah. And uh, of course, we'll we'll talk about that here in a second. So let's listen into Leviticus twenty three, and then we will discuss it. Praise Yah. Vaikra, Leviticus chapter twenty three. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Yasharel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of Yahuwah, which ye shall proclaim to be holy assemblies. Even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a holy assembly. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of Yahuwah in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of Yahuwah, even holy assemblies, which ye shall proclaim in their appointed times. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at evening, is Yahuwah's Pesach. And on the fifteenth day of the same month, is the feast of matzah unto Yahuwah. Seven days ye must eat matzah, unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a holy assembly, ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah seven days. In the seventh day is a holy assembly, ye shall do no servile work therein. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Yasharel, and say unto them, When ye are come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before Yahuwah, to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it, and ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto Yahuwah. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenths deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of a hymn. And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your Elohim it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. 
And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Shavuot, Sabbaths, shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahuwah. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto Yahuwah. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one bullock, and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto Yahuwah, with their meat offering and their drink offerings, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto Yahuwah. Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before Yahuwah. With the two lambs, they shall be holy to Yahuwah for the priest. And ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be a holy assembly unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in your dwellings throughout your generations. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, you shall not make clean riddance of the corners of your field when you reap. Neither shall you gather any gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am Yahuwah Elohim. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Yasharel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of Shofarot, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, the day of the awakening blast, a holy assembly. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month is Yom Kippurim, the day of atonement. It shall be a holy assembly unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is Yom Kippurim, to make an atonement for you before Yahuwah Elohim. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that does any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening unto evening shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Yasharel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast of Sukkot, tabernacles, for seven days unto Yahuwah. On the first day shall be a holy assembly, ye shall do no servile work therein. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. On the eighth day shall be a holy assembly unto you, and ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah. It is a solemn assembly, and ye shall do no servile work therein. These are the feasts of Yahuwah, which ye shall proclaim to be holy assemblies, to offer an offering made by fire unto Yahuwah, a burnt offering and a meat offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything upon his day. Besides the Shavuot, Sabbaths of Yahuwah, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your freewill offerings, which ye give unto Yahuwah. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto Yahuwah seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before Yahuwah Elohim seven days. And ye shall keep it a feast unto Yahuwah seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in Sukkoth, booths, seven days. All that are Yasharel born shall dwell in Sukkoth. 
that your generations may know that I made the children of Yasharel to dwell in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim. I am Yahuwah Elohim. And Moshe declared unto the children of Yashrael the feasts of Yahuwah. And praise Yah indeed for the feasts of Yahuwah. So um, one thing I just, since we're right here at the bottom, and I actually don't think I have it in the notes, but it says here in Leviticus 23, 42, you shall dwell in Sukkahs seven days. All that are Yasharel born shall dwell in Sukkahs. So some people are like, oh, well, I'm not a, I'm just a grafted in branch. You know, I'm not, not, it's interesting. We, I think we went over it. Um, I think, it, is it, is it Leviticus 19? I don't have the notes here. Uh No, it says, shall be as one of you. Anyways, it's, it's, I'm pretty sure it's, it's, I know it's in Leviticus. It says that, uh, those, uh, even the stranger that sojourns among you that offers an offering to Yahuwah, he shall be even as one born among you. So, uh, just wanted to make that mention. And there's, there's, there's really should be no reason to want to excuse yourself from doing these. Uh, this is, I'll tell you, we just got back from Sukkot and that's, also, that's why you know we we weren't uh, we didn't have the Torah portions the last few weeks. Uh, the <laughs> Sukkot uh, it just gets so busy that there's just no time. Uh, literally, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, which sometimes is uh, in the wee uh, wee hours in the morning with those those late night campfires. Uh, I just didn't have time. And um, but I really those of you that don't have um, that don't have fellowship yet or an assembly. I would say, you know, let this be uh, the time that you find one before uh, Passover comes up. We have about six months. Really find a fellowship to do this. Because I don't know if you noticed, but all throughout this, it kept saying the assembly, the assembly, the assembly, the holy assembly, the holy assembly. And, and I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'm not judging anybody, you know, for, for what, you know, what you're currently able to do, not able to do. You know, you may live in an apartment in the middle of the city, you know, nobody, and you're doing the best you can in your living room. I'm not judging you. Hallelujah. But I'll tell you, um, being in the assembly, you know, part of it, you know, we're all scattered, but whether whether it's just, you know, two or three other families to fellowship with or an entire assembly, um, getting together and, and doing Yahweh's sh- uh, Shabbats, new moons, feast days, Brothers and sisters, this is such a big part of life. Um, I, I don't know how else to, to, to word this. Uh, it, I think it's imperative that we be part of the assembly in any way we can. And um, it's it's our heart's desire to help in any way, to help connect um, brothers and sisters. And um, man, may we just continue to find each other here. Because uh, we do need a delight in the Shabbats. Uh, and, and speaking of the Shabbats, this whole chapter is talking about the feasts of Yahuwah. Uh, and consider that not every, um, they're not all called feasts. I think this is kind of a lazy word to call all these. These are the Moedim, is the Hebrew word. And during some of these Moedim, appointed times, they are feasts. You know, we, we feast to him, and some not. We'll, you know, we'll talk about that in a sec. But the Shabbat in general is a Moed. It's an appointed time. Like, it's an appointment. Like, we were supposed to meet with Yahuwah, our Father, on these occasions. Um, we're supposed to meet on the Sabbaths weekly. Uh, we're supposed to meet on the new moons monthly, uh, and we're supposed to meet at the appoint- other appointed times, which is what the rest of this chapter talks about. But the point is the Sabbath itself is a weekly appointment uh, with Yahuwah Most High. Uh, and just a quick reminder, Isaiah 56, 1-8, through 8, Thus says Yahuwah, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that does this and the son of man that lays hold on it, that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger, the foreigner, right, that has joined himself to Yahweh speak, saying, Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people. So he's like, don't don't say that. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house, and within my walls, a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And this began with those who, you know, talks about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a big part of this. And, um, and, and, and consider in many instances here, it doesn't really 
show true in the English, but these Sabbaths are, are, are plural. And so I don't think it's just talking about his weekly Sabbath, but his feast days in general. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Yahuwah to serve him and to love the name of Yahuwah, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Shabbat from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Yahweh Elohim, which gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, Yet I will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. Hallelujah. Great foreshadowing, of course, of gathering uh, all the nations to be onefold. And uh, just a reminder of Ezekiel, this is part of the denunciation of Israel. I'm just going to read a few verses here. It says, And I gave them, verse 11, I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them, like live forever. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths, plural. So I, this is not talking about just the weekly Sabbath, but the Sabbaths throughout the, the Moedim, the appointed times, the feast days, if you will, to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am Yahuwah, that sanctifies them, right? So he's like, hey, do these. Do these feasts that honor me, that honor my son, that are all about my son. And so this is a huge part, brothers and sisters, about walking in the Torah, keeping the commandments. And here, just another exhortation, uh, Hebrews 10. And again, I'm not judging anyone. This is just an encouragement that if you're like, don't have any fellowship, brothers and sisters, look for it with all your heart. Don't just feignedly say, oh, I looked and I can't find anyone. I'll tell you, if you if you really put your mind to it I, and, and you really ask Yahweh, pray for it, I can imagine he would answer in a mighty way. It says, uh, Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. I don't know about you, but I really see the end times approaching. I don't have no idea when it is. I'll be honest, I, I couldn't tell you if it's next week uh, or, or if I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, pass away at a nice old ripe age, I have no clue, uh, to be honest with you. No man knows the day, the hour. I humbly admit that, uh, in my feeble attempts of trying to discern, uh, exactly when he's coming back. <laughs> but the point is, is we think it's, we know it's soon. Um, it doesn't take, um, someone of massive intelligence to, to recognize that. I want to read, uh, I want to read, uh, something from, uh, actually, I wanna, before we get into all the feasts, I want to go over John 4. This is when Messiah is talking to the woman at the well. <clears throat> she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, Samaria, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And so this is basically, she's she's paraphrasing or loosely quoting uh, Deuteronomy 16, which says that you know we can't do the, pa- the Passover anywhere else other than uh, the place where he sets his name which, of course, is interpreted as Jerusalem. And so, uh, of course, during the time of Yahushua, when the temple was there, uh, before the destruction, before the dispersion, yes, that's where one would go. Uh, and then, but however, but listen to what Messiah says. Yahushua says to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Yerushalayim worship the Father. And we know this is talking about the feast days and the offerings because that's that was the requirement. Uh, when they, It wasn't about the weekly Sabbaths. It wasn't about the new moons. It was the three commanded feast days where they had to go to Jerusalem to worship, to offer their offering. They couldn't do it anywhere else. So Yahushua is directly talking about the feast days here because he says, Yahushua says, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet Yerushalayim worship the Father, or a.k.a. do the feast days. Um, so, and then what's interesting is in the book of the Nazarene, he had the same passage with actually a little more detail and, and a little more, uh, said a little more succinctly. Uh, and so this is Nazarene 6, 46 through 47 says, The Samaritan woman said to Yahushua, Master, I can see you are one of those special people who know all things prophet. Now tell me, is it true what your people tell us that we should worship at the temple at Yerushalayim to reach the ear of Elohim? For he is only there and not on Mount Gerizim, which is um, Samaria. Yehusha told her, be assured the time is coming when the place of worship is unimportant. For 
Though your people worship without understanding the nature of worship, while the Yahudim worship with this knowledge, neither know the true nature of worship. The time is coming when all who understand the nature of worship will do so in Ruach, in the spirit, and in the light of truth. And he specifically says the place of un- a place of worship is unimportant. And furthermore, brothers and sisters, we have to recognize that it's because of the spirit of the Most High dwelt at the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, well, that temple departed in Ezekiel 9. We read all about that. And then, of course, the temple was destroyed, so he's not there. And I'll tell you, I don't believe his spirit is dwelling in Jerusalem, the, the den of dragons, the habitations of devils, uh, a place of screeching owls, uh, a place where the, the, the abomination is set up on the temple mount. Uh, and so his spirit's not there. Where is his spirit, uh, assembly of the Most High? Well, if it's, of course, it's in you. It's in his people. So wherever his people are assembling, there he is in the midst of that. He said that himself. Where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of you. His spirit is dwelling there. Don't let these whoever people, whoever they are, tell you that you can't do the feast days in a foreign land. Read the book of Tobit. He did it. And regardless of that, there's lots of verses that can be thrown back and forth. I'm here to, I'm here to that Messiah already settled this debate. And I'm following what Messiah says, and so I'm keeping the feasts in a foreign land. Hallelujah. It's the joy of my life, and praise, yeah. All right, so let's talk about uh, some of, the, some of the, um, the feasts here. And um, the Passover here, uh, obviously we know this is in connection uh, to our, our Messiah. I think, of course, I'm sure everyone knows that here. But 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened for even Messiah. Our Passover is sacrifice for us. And actually, I don't even know why I didn't put the verse before. What am I thinking? Oh, wait. Is it? Yeah, okay. This is the next verse. So Paul is plainly telling us that Messiah is our Passover lamb. And then he says, therefore, let us keep the feast. So some people are like, don't do it. Don't eat lamb. Don't do any of this because Messiah, you know, fulfilled it all for us. I mean, that just goes right back to the same old thing that, that the false doctrines we learned in the church, uh, that, you know, we didn't have to do the law because Yahushua did it for us. And so, you know, people are saying the same thing now, uh, which I, in love, I rebuke. Uh, I believe Messiah and Paul literally, literally says, therefore, let us keep the feast. So praise, yeah. So obviously Messiah is, so when we do the Passover, we're doing it in honor of Messiah, our tr- the true spotless lamb. And in my opinion, I could be wrong, when we don't do it because of a, a, a verse that is being misused and misunderstood, I think we're dishonoring Messiah. This is all about honoring him, the, the, the true spotless lamb. We also know that during this feast, the Passover is uh, is really part of the whole unleavened bread week. In the whole unleavened bread week, you have the inauguration meal, which is the Passover, and then uh, of course in the midst of it, you also have first fruits. So you really have three feast days all kind of rolled into one: the Passover, which is all about, uh, of course, Messiah being slain, his blood covering our homes, uh, uh, protecting us from the destroyer, uh, from death. Uh, the scriptures even say it says that uh, the lamb is part of the the marking process. Uh, boy, this is gonna be a long Torah portion. I can I can I can smell it. Um, and it says, yeah. Okay. And so the blood, right? The blood of the lamb shall be. So it doesn't say the blood, but this is obviously talking about the lamb right here. The blood shall be for you a token. The KJV says token. This is the Hebrew word ot, which means sign. Um, so, right, or mark, and the blood shall be for a mark or a sign upon the houses. And so, in a spiritual way, Yahushua's blood is a sign or a mark on our house, the, the, the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh. Hallelujah. Praise you indeed. Let's go to, oh, <laughs> I already had that. Okay, my apologies. Okay, so also during this feast is the, of course, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which Yahusha is our unleavened bread. Leaven can, of course, could be interpreted as sin. That's the number one interpretation. Um, the number one answer, if you will, is, is sin. The number two, though, is the doctrine of men. But John 6.35 says, Yahusha said to them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. He is the bread, right? So he is, the, of course, the heavenly manna, but he's also the unleavened bread. Check it out. Matthew 16.6 6 says, 
Yahushua said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which during the week of uh, unleavened bread, were not to eat any bread with any leaven in it, which is what you know makes the bread puffed up and, you know, makes it rise. Unleavened bread is more like flat cakes. If you've ever had pita bread, um, more like, or, or tortillas. Um, uh, so anyways, but take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So there's a spiritual lesson to be learned during the week of unleavened bread. Matthew 16, 11 through 12 says, how is it that you do not understand that I spoke it not to you concerning bread, like physical bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So leaven during the week of unleavened bread, that can be also a reminder every year to make sure that we're not abiding in the doctrines of men, but only in the doctrine of Yahweh Sabaoth himself through the preserved word we have today. Exodus 12, 15 says, Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from his people. And so just also it's a reminder to let us know that if we do abide in the doctrines of men, well, that does res- it's going to result in death because you can't, you can't abide by the commandments of men and the commandments of Yahweh in, in, re- in regards to reverence for Yah. Because when I say the commandments of men, Make no mistake, I'm not talking about the the laws of the land. I am in full uh, agreement that we are to keep the laws of the land that are not in contradiction to the law of the Most High. When I'm talking about the laws of men, I'm talking about the added man-made traditions that you see all throughout uh, Judaism and Christianity and things like that. And so uh, that's a reminder that, hey, the the, the direction uh, of man-made uh, doctrines, man-made uh, commandments is, is going to be death. So Exodus uh, 12, 18 through 19 says, In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 1 and 20th day of the month at evening. So basically saying, um, you know, we're supposed to eat unleavened bread for seven days. And what's interesting about this is, um, again, I'm bringing it up only because it's brought up all the time. People continue to rebuke me and why I have not changed to morning morning. Because literally here, he tells you, um, eat unleavened bread for seven days. Oh, and I'm going to tell you how to count seven days. And he tells you to do so from evening to evening. So I may be simple-minded, but the way I think is, okay, if Yahweh Most High, you told me how to count seven days, and you told me to do so by evening to evening, well then, therefore, I must deduce that one day is also evening to evening. Seven days there shall there no be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eats that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Exodus 13, 7 through 10, Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread seen with you, neither shall there be leaven seen with you in all your quarters. And ye shall show your son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which Yahweh did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign or a mark, there's that same Hebrew word, upon your hand and for a memorial between your eyes. So listen, we, we like to talk about the mark of the beast so much, about how it's on the hand and the forehead. Look, brothers and sisters, when we walk in the commandments, and so that's why when we walk in the, in the in the feast days, he's literally marking us that, hey, you are mine. And so what a dangerous doctrine for people who say that they're followers of Yahushua uh, to say to not keep the feast days. Uh, they're literally encouraging people not to be marked by Yahuwah. What a, what a rough seat to be in. May Yahuwah bless them and give them eyes to see. But literally, he's like, I'm going to mark you that you're mine when you keep the unleavened bread uh, week. That Yahweh's Torah may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand has Yahweh brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in a season from year to year. So you can either listen to men or you can listen to Yahweh, and this is what he told us to do. As for me and my house, we're going to serve Yahweh with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Hallelujah, Yahweh. All right, let's talk about the Feast of First Fruits. Um, and by the way, so those of you are like, oh, when... When's Passover? So it's going to be uh, roughly uh, roughly five and a half months from now. I'll get you some dates soon. Uh, which we have the downloadable cal- calendar for 2025 in the description box if you want to take a look at it. Let's talk about first fruits. Um, let's also rejoice in our Messiah. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. It says, But now is Messiah risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them that sleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Mashiach shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Mashiach, the firstfruits, afterward they that are Messiahs at his coming. 
So uh, the fr- Messiah is the first fruit. So when we, and again, the first fruits is in the midst of the week of unleavened bread. So listen, when we're celebrating it and celebrating it in our current day, we're celebrating that Messiah is our spotless lamb. We're celebrating that he is the unleavened bread and he brought the pure doctrine from heaven, from our heavenly father, right? And that he is the first fruits of the resurrection. So when we do these feast days, we're literally honoring and celebrating him. Let no one take you away from the Torah of the most high through beguiling speech and typically rough beguiling speech. Uh, every time I've heard uh, this not keep the feast day doctrine presented, uh, observe the fruit, brothers and sisters. Observe whether there's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long suffering, and self control uh, in the midst uh, and ki- uh, kindness in the midst of um, uh, what they do. Let's talk about Shavuot, the feast of weeks. And some of the the spiritual implications here, John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, the Torah, it's expedient for you or beneficial for you that I go away, as in being sacrificed, the Passover lamb. For if I go not away, the Comforter, or the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Acts 1, 4, and being assembled, again, this is kind of the theme of this week's Torah portion, is getting together. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, there's protection in the assembly, and I feel bad for people that are on a lonely island. If you look at the patterns of how wolves attack, they try to isolate and get away from the pack, the, the group, uh, from the herd, if you will, because they're much easier to attack um, by themselves, lonely, alone. I'll tell you, I love the assembly of Yahuwah, and... There's nothing I'd rather do in my life than spend time with the assembly of Yahuwah. And I, I really feel for you that those of you out there that don't know that yet, don't know that love. I mean, I, I, I hope and assume it's a love from the, from the Most High through His Ruach. I mean, it says that Yahusha loved the assembly, right? So in Acts 1-4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Yerushalayim, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, said he, you have heard of me. Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Big day. Hallelujah. So, um, also something to, to consider on the, the Shabbat, the Feast of Weeks. This is the this is known as the time of of the giving of the covenant. Um, and in what we understand now, spirit and truth. Earlier, we were at uh, John four, and I actually didn't read far enough for this point. We read the woman, and then going back, and he and he was like, "Hey, uh, you know, Jerusalem, you're, there's gonna be a time when you know they're gonna worship in this mountain or at Jerusalem." But then it says here, verse 23, But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. Elohim is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And so it's interesting, uh, Shavuot, thousands of years ago, uh, back in the time of the Exodus, uh, the time of Moshe, uh, the truth, the Torah, was given at Shavuot. And then, uh, of course, thousands of years later, the time of the apostles, uh, the spirit uh, was given broadly. Not that there was the first time the Spirit was ever given. Moses had the Spirit. David had his Spirit. Uh, even Saul had his Spirit for a while, and many others had the Spirit of Yahuwah. But it wasn't until that Shavuot that his Spirit was given broadly uh, to those. Um, and so these are some of the things we think about and praise the Most High for. Uh, of course, we, we thank him for his Spirit and truth. We thank him for his Son, uh, so many other things. Let's go on to uh, Feast of Trumpets uh, at uh, Leviticus 23, 23 through 25. In short, this is not, there's not a whole lot to this uh, feast day that we have here, but in short, you know, this is the announcement of the return of Yahusha. Psalm 47, oh, clap your hands, all you people, shout, teruah. This is Yom Teruah. The, the Hebrew word for Feast of Trumpets is Yom Teruah. And so in this passage here, it says, all you people, teruah unto Elohim with the voice of triumph. For Yahweh Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. And this word terrible doesn't mean terrible, bad, like in our English language now. 
like like he's like majestic like powerful like and it's and in, in, in awe and you know in, in great fear of like whoa that kind of terrible like, whoa um he shall subdue the people under us the nations under our feet he shall choose our inheritance for us the excellency of jacob whom he loved elohim is gone up with a shout a teruah yahweh with the sound of a trumpet the Feast of Trumpet, shofars, if you will. And so sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. And it goes on to say that he reigns over the heathen. So this is the, the, the return of the king. First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the master himself, Yahusha, shall descend from heaven with a shout, that's a teruah, the voice of the archangel with the trump of Elohim and the dead in Mashiach shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air and so shall we ever be with, with the master. So this is the return of Yahusha and this is uh, the announcement of the coming uh, the coming day uh, of Yahuwah which we'll see here in uh, Joel 2, 15 through, I'll just do 15. So we have the three Fall feast days here, all in one. You have blow the shofar in Zion, the trumpet, the feast of trumpets, sanctify a fast, which uh, is how I understand the the day of atonement, and then call a solemn assembly. Only can point to the eighth great day of Sukkot. So here you have three feast days: one, two, three. Uh, and so this is the return of Yahusha. This is the the destruction, uh, the the fall of the kingdoms, the destruction of Babylon and those with her. And then the uh, the solemn assembly. This is the the rejoicing. This is the wedding feast. Uh, and so, any case, uh, let's go to atonement. First John two one through two. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yahusha Hamashiach, the righteous, and he is a propitiation, which is a fancy word for atonement for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And a long story short, the Day of Atonement is a day of mourning. Uh, it is a day of, of afflicting yourself. Uh, I do believe it's a day of fasting. I think Joel was is a really good witness. Uh, also, when you search the scriptures and you talk about uh, afflicting yourself, because it says, For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that day, he shall be cut off from his people. Now, it doesn't say whoever doesn't fast in that day shall be cut off. But, hey, I'll tell you, the scriptures truly define uh, afflicting yourself as uh, a fast. And then here, uh, another, I think, strong witness is you have the three feast days, specifically because this uh, this Ha'atzeret, the Shemini, Shemini Ha'atzeret, the eighth day, the eighth great day, the solemn assembly, this only points to the eighth great day of Sukkot. So since you have witness number one, blow the shofar on Zion as the Feast of Trumpets, and you have witness two as the solemn assembly as the eighth great day of Sukkot, by implication and a reasoning mind can say, wow, all right, this clearly shows us that the Day of Atonement is for fasting. Praise. Yeah, for more on that, uh, we have a video dedicated to the Day of Atonement. And on, by the way, all, I'm really going quickly through all these feast days. Uh, if you go to our um, Parable, of the, sorry, Parable of the Vineyard YouTube channel, you go to the playlist, there should be a feast day playlist where we go through each one individually and discuss a lot more because each feast day deserves its own study and not just a breeze through. Uh, <clears throat> also, I just want to make mention that every matter that Yahuwah, uh, especially every debatable matter, is established by two or three witnesses. And uh, it's interesting that um, we in the, in the, the uh, Feast of um, Unleavened Bread, it's commanded to do it evening to evening. Their second witness here is, uh, of course, the Day of Atonement, evening to evening. Some would argue, well, those are the two exceptions. Everything else is morning to morning. I just find it interesting that he never commands us to do anything morning to morning uh, in regards to a Shabbat or a feast day. Um, but when it comes to um, you know these two witnesses, they're right there in our, in our face. And, and for me, as, as a at least in my reasoning mind, hey, you gave me two solid witnesses right there that have to do with your feast days. Uh, I'm going to apply that to the rest. And we see this also, and we see how a precept in one feast day can apply to another. And the reason I say that is because Yahweh kind of hid that also. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. We see that we know that Passover is not the only feast where people feast. Uh, it, if nothing else, at minimum, Sukkot. Right? And so, but in Sukkot, there's commanded Sabbaths, but it doesn't say anything about how people are going to eat and it's a Sabbath. So here's the heart of the Father, and this is how one can apply one precept in one feast day to another. It says, this is Exodus 12, 16, and in the first day, this is talking about unleavened bread, there shall be done, there should be a holy convocation, and in the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, 
that only may be done of you. So only in the Passover do we have the heart of the Father. So like, okay, well, if we can't do any work, how do we eat? Oh, oh okay. No work, but only that which uh, basically cooking, only that may be done of you. Okay, so he told us in Passover, well, what do we do now for the Sabbath? What do we do for Sukkot? What do we do for all these other feast days where people need to eat? He already told you right here. This is his heart. And so my point is, when it comes to the evening-to-evening argument, he already told you his heart of how to, to, to look at the matter. So that's just how I understand it. Blessings. All right, so Sukkot. We just got done uh, celebrating Sukkot. It's literally uh, the best time of the year. I mean, whatever Christmas was to people, uh, Sukkot is 100 times better. Um, you know, I remember, I remember Christmas leaving people broke, drained and cranky and hungover what i see here at the feast of tabernacles and other feasts where people get together i see people i see cups spiritual cups being refilled i see people being built up i see people uh establishing friendships and relationships that last forever uh i see the culmination of loving one another coming together at these and so uh Sukkot 2024 was uh was no exception to that uh probably one of the best so praise yeah uh, but so literally, uh, it's literally a, an eight day camping trip. I mean, and it's so much fun, especially we've been doing it over the last four years. Uh, you know, even people that don't live in the same state, we get, to, we've been, our children see each other, you know, twice a year. Usually, uh, we usually, you know, camp out big for, uh, Passover and unleavened bread and also for, uh, Sukkot. And it's become the joy of our lives. Like this is how, our children are being raised up. They're they're being raised raised up in, in you know a couple times a year going on these long camping trips where they're just spending so much time with other brothers and sisters. And you know, if if spiritually in the spiritual realm, if we're like lights, right? If we're if our ruach should be like shining lights, you know, what happens what happens when you take one match and light it? You go, okay, you got this little thing. What happens then if you light the whole matchbook, right? Well, what happens if you get 500 matchsticks together? That's what happens at these feast days. And that's why I'm really, you know, really, if, the, if someone has convinced you not to do these feast days anymore, really to pray about it. This is a huge part of what Yahweh has, how he's told us to live, live life. And to just cut all that out uh, on, a, on a technicality, um, because it's supposed to be, because the scripture said it's supposed to be in Jerusalem, when Messiah already told you, right? Hey, he already settled this entire debate for us. But if you have not celebrated a feast of Sukkot yet, oh, brothers and sisters, this is some of the some of the highlights of our lives. And part of the spiritual implications here, of course, um, and let's see. It's talking about you shall dwell in booths seven days, all that are Israelite born, you shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh Elohim. I'll tell you, it's also neat when when you get hundreds of people together, or even just dozens, whatever. It doesn't have to be a big suko. It can be you know, thirty of you. Uh, it can be twenty of you. But when you get together and and you live a life that's uh, a little freer of some of the modern conveniences, right? It's night. People get together. They share things. It's real community. Basically, people get a sneak peek of what it's like to live in community for a week, eight days. Some people really love it, and some people aren't ready for it. John 1.14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So in a, in a, in a, in a partial way, Yahushua did fulfill Sukkot in that He dwelt among us. And so part of Sukkot is, you know, the, in the millennial reign will be dwell, part of the, sorry, the, the, the end time significance of Sukkot is it's a picture of the millennial reign and where we'll dwell with Him for a thousand years. Uh, but of course, the Son of Man did come down and dwell with us physically uh, for a time, and uh, we'll do so again in the future. Zechariah 14, 16 through 19, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh Sebaot, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh Sebaot, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith Yahweh will smite the heathen that come up not up to the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to the Feast of Tabernacles. So, hey, good idea to start practicing Feast of Tabernacles now. Hallelujah. Um, okay, let's go to uh, 
Leviticus 24. I think we spoke enough about the generalities of the feast days and uh, the the call uh, to actually walk in them. And um, a loving rebuke to those of you out there who are instructing the house of Israel not to do these feast days. Um, yeah. Let's go to Leviticus 24, and then we'll talk about it. Praise yeah. Vaikra, Leviticus chapter 24. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Command the children of Yasharel that they bring unto you pure olive oil, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually, without the veil of the testimony. In the tabernacle of the assembly shall Aharon order it from the evening unto the morning before Yahuwah continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall order the lamps upon the pure menorah, seven-branched candlestick, before Yahuwah continually. And you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two-tenths deals shall be in one cake. And you shall set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before Yahuwah. And you shall put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even a memorial made by fire unto Yahuwah. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before Yahuwah continually, being taken from the children of Yasharel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aharon and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of Yahuwah made by fire by a perpetual statute. And the son of a Yasharelitith woman, whose father was a Mitzri, went out among the children of Yashrael, and this son of the Yashraelitith woman and a man of Yashrael strove together in the camp. And the Yashraelitith woman's son blasphemed the name of Yahuwah and cursed, and they brought him unto Moshe, and his mother's name was Shelomith, the daughter of Divrai, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in ward, that the mind of Yahuwah might be showed them. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Bring forth him that has cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the assembly stone him. And you shall speak unto the children of Yasharel, saying, Whosoever curses his Elohim shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemes the name of Yahuwah, he shall surely be put to death. And all the assembly shall certainly stone him, as well the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemes the name of Yahuwah, shall be put to death. And he that kills any man shall surely be put to death. And he that kills a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. And he that kills a beast, he shall restore it. And he that kills a man, he shall be put to death. Ye shall have one manner of law, as well for the stranger, as for one of your own country. For I am Yahuwah Elohim. And Moshe spoke to the children of Yashrael, that they should bring forth him that had cursed out of the camp, and stone him with stones. And the children of Yashrael did as Yahuwah commanded Moshe. Oh, nice sound effect there, Jake. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's talk about um, Leviticus 24. There's a couple of really interesting things to pull from here. Specifically, I really enjoy here the, the beginning of this. I think there's such a spiritual um, connection here. I don't know. There's, there's such a, a deep uh, a thought here that, that I think permeates all throughout uh, scripture, especially in Revelation, and, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but verse 2 says, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto you pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually. I think this is a huge key. Maybe that's the word I was thinking for. This is a huge key um, to discerning parables, some of the parables. Uh, some of you already know where I'm going. When you when you see this light and the lamps, uh, you know, and the oil, um, obviously, we're we're probably gonna uh, we're probably gonna be end up reading uh, the uh, 
uh, Matthew 25 with the wise and foolish virgins. Uh, but Proverbs 6.23, a couple things here. It says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. L- let's just kind of break this down for a bit. We discussed this in, in Exodus. Um, we're not going to re-go cover the whole thing, but in general, the seven-branch menorah is a representation of uh, his people. We learn that through Revelation. Um, do I have it in here? We learn it in, in Revelation um, 120 that uh, the churches, the seven seven branch candlestick represents the seven assemblies. The seven assemblies, of course, are his people. Uh, and so the light of the Torah, so let's walk with me through this. The law is light. So the command, the, the end result was that the lamps would burn continually. And if the light is the Torah, of course, the Torah should be shining brightly in his people at all times. But nevertheless, the people themselves have to bring the oil for it to continue. So we have to bring that obedience. We have to, I don't like the term skin in the game here, but for lack of better terms, we got to put forth effort. We got to, we have to bring our, our piece of this to do it. Um, so some deep spiritual connections here. And so uh, also Proverbs 31, 10 through 18, thinking about the, the candlestick, the light being lit. Proverbs 31, 10, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he has he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is yet night and gives meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds her loins with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. Her candle goes not out by night. This is a lot of Book of Revelation uh, talk here, by the way, uh, in a spiritual way. But it says her candle goes not out by night. Why? Because she's busy doing what's right. She's doing what's right in the sight of Yahuwah. And it's not just the check marks of the, of the Torah, but it's just being a, a productive, good, and fruitful person. Uh, let's talk more about this candle thing. Um, uh, Revelation one twenty: the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, or menorahs. The seven stars are the angels of the seven assemblies, and the seven candlesticks, which you saw, are the seven assemblies. So it just says it very plainly there for us. Uh, I want to show you more um, about this candle deal. <clears throat> so all throughout scriptures, it talks about how the candle of the wicked is put out, right? And it says, and his candle shall be put out with him. Listen here, Job twenty one seventeen. how often is the candle of the wicked put out? Um, let's see, Psalm eighteen twenty eight. for you will light my candle, Yahweh my Elohim will light my darkness. Proverbs twenty twenty seven. now here's an awesome one. The spirit of man is the candle of Yahuwah. That's a defining term. So now we're getting to the heart of what is this candle here? It's the spirit of man. Well, the spirit of the wicked are put out. The spirit of the righteous will continue forever. Proverbs 24, 20, for there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. We just read this in Proverbs 31, 18, right? Her candle goes not out by night. Conversely, um, you know, with um, in the book of Revelation, I don't think I have it here in Revelation, uh, her candle is put out. The wicked is put out. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple more. Let's see. Yeah. Anyways, and of course, uh, Yahusha gives the example of letting our light shine, and letting our light shine before men, our good works to be shown before men. Revelation 18, and it's talking about the, the harlot, the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in you. So she's the opposite of a Proverbs 31 woman. And uh, anyways, so really, the, again, does the children of Israel bring the oil for the light for, to burn continue in the lamps. This definitely plays into Matthew 25. The, the wise and foolish virgin says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps. Right? We know we're, we're on the right track here. We're talking about lamps. Uh, of course, we have Proverbs 6.23, which talks about um, the lamps and the, the light in regards to the law. 
So ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom, five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, which is part of the commandment, part of the part of the obedience. But the wise took oil in their vessels, obedience to the Torah. Remember, the lamps is the commandments, and the Torah is light. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But they answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather them to sell that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I don't know you. I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour where the Son of Man comes. Matthew, talking about being wise or foolish, Matthew seven twenty four through 27 says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will like him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And of course, the foolish one does not hear the sayings of Messiah and does not do them. A couple other passages in the book of the Nazarene, which, by the way, I'm, I know I'm cruising through this really fast. I have notes study notes on all this. So if you want to go back and study this or, or like, oh, I forgot what Adam said. I have all this written down uh, for you. So Book of the Nazarene, chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 says, Yehusha gathered his followers around him and taught as follows. These days are a night of ignorance when all is dark, but I am the light which will dispel the darkness. My light will light your lamps and you too will become bearers of the light. I am the light to point the way and none can find the way to Yahuwah except by the light. I come to testify concerning the Father. For those following my way see Elohim in the light of the Father. Does not a father chastise in love and punish with affection? Does he not give you tasks only just within your power of accomplishment? Even as with an earthly father, so with the heavenly Father, who is infinitely greater. Being flesh, we understand earthly ways. But the ways of Yahuwah may be also known and understood, for his Ruach resides in all men. Be upright in faith yourselves and teach uprightness and truth fear no man especially the rich and powerful for they live in servitude to their possessions and position you must carry the light to many but few will be those who light the lamp of their lives from it good word we're also going to read one more passage not stream seven eight through nine page 70 of the pdf Nazarim 7, 8 through 9 says, There are two laws, the laws of men and the Torah of the Father who is in heaven. When I speak of the Torah, I do not mean the law of men. I am the light illuminating Yahuwah's Torah, so men see it more clearly. And though I fulfill the Torah, I do not change it. Oh, this is crazy. Yeah. Never say this is right or that is wrong, but only this is right or wrong according to the Torah and in the light of Yahushua. I bring new oil for the lamp of the Torah, for that within it is now impure, and the light produces too much obscuring smoke. For I am the Son of Man and bear the sufferings of men, coming to fulfill their hopes, even as it has been foretold. Is it not said among the Jesneth, the sons of Jesse, that the Son of Man is the perfected man who will set the standard for those who wish to be true sons of Elohim? Praise ya. So, brothers and sisters, we are to endure no matter what comes our way, no matter what the adversary puts in as a stumbling block for us to walk out of or fall out of the way, we will continue to bring obedience to his Torah, obedience to the Torah according to his son and how he told us to, to keep it, for that light to be burning continually in us. Consider all these things inside the tabernacle, the lamps, uh, the bread, uh, it all represented his people. The showbread, it, it represented the 12 tribes, uh, the, the, the lamp, the seven, uh, the seven churches. These are all representing his people in different ways. How much more can he show us, I love you. Everything I made is for you if you would only just keep my commandments. And that's definitely a reasonable service, is it not? I say yes. I say yes. Um, let's see what else I had here. This is a really big principle as well that we should look at. Because consider the... We talked about it when we discussed the, the right rulings. Exodus 21 through 24, the Mishpah team. That's the... Well, if this happens, this is how it's rectified. Um, um, judgments, if you will. Well... 
we learned through that that not every single possible scenario was going to be written down in a book. Otherwise, we'd have you know a 50,000-page book, and it would be ridiculous. So what Yahweh has done is given us his heart on matters uh, in that talk in broad generalities that we should be able to apply to different situations. However, not everything's written down. So Leviticus 24.12 is another really key part of our walk. It says, And they put him in war that the mind of Yahweh might be showed them. So they didn't know what to, exactly to do. Like, ooh, it's not completely spelled out here. I'm here to tell you that uh, in an active body uh, with with a, 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 a governing body of leadership, like if there's a time where you know what to do is not clearly laid out in the Torah, we get together, we pray, and we ask Yahweh to show us. And t- I tell you what, he shows us. He doesn't just appear in our midst and say, this is what you do. Of course not. Uh, well, not of course not, but at least for now, that's not how he talks to us. But he shows us in different ways. Um, Sometimes a scripture will come to mind to somebody and they're like, oh yeah, you know, or, or um, anyways, there's, there's different ways he answers us. Uh, some, he may give someone the answer in their mind real quick and they bring it up and they're like, oh yeah, and everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, yeah, you're right. That, that's exactly right. And anyways, um, but this is a, a, an excellent principle, even just for life. It doesn't have to be a matter of judgment or, or mediations. It could be like, where do you want me to be, Father? Where do you want me to live? What do you want me to, our, our, our family to set roots down? Is this where you want us to be? Uh, is this the job you want us to be in? Uh, that the mind of Yahweh might be shown in all your doings, right? All right, let's go to Leviticus 24, 20. Uh, it is talking about, of course, the eye for eye, uh, tooth for tooth. Um, we covered this uh, back in um, back in um, Exodus, but let's just touch it again really quickly. Again, books of Nazarene, um, we're going to chapter 16, 48 through 49, page 156 of the PDF, at least the version I have. Um, we're going to read actually verses 48 through 49. It says, The holy books of the Yahudim say that an eye shall be taken for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But the words of the Torah must be interpreted with justice. For if an eye be taken from he who put out another's, or a tooth from someone who had knocked out the tooth of another, is the loss made good in this manner? He's like, does that really make it good? Like, if I accidentally knocked your tooth out, you knocking mine out, does that really make it good? And he's asking a question. Or if a one-eyed man causes him with two eyes to lose one, shall he be made blind and so suffer a greater loss? Or if a man with two eyes causes a man with one eye to be made blind, shall he lose both? Henceforward, let the loss be made in good in silver or through labor. For now, the law of revenge shall be overruled by the law of retribution. Retribution, even though it still sounds like a really harsh word, it's really just a uh, a sum of money or, like you said, or, or labor uh, that uh, is good in co- in compensation for the, the wrong rather than revenge, which is literally the eye for an eye. All laws shall now be administered under the rule of recompense. All these things I give you that they may be established and added to the Torah so that henceforth they be used in judgments among the just. And this is exactly what we do today. Uh, whether, whether you know, whether, um, yeah, I mean, this is just how, this is how things are done today. Uh, and so, praise Yah. Uh, and then also... It says here, Leviticus 24, 22 says, You shall have one manner of law as well as for the stranger as for one of your own country, for I am Yahuwah Elohim. So having this one, I'll tell you, uh, as someone who's in a live-in community, I'm thankful to have a single standard that anything that comes up could and should be answered somewhere in Scripture. And if not, then of course, see uh, the verse we just talked about, about the, the, the mind of Yahweh being revealed. But this is uh, also spelled out really nicely for us uh, in a little parable that Yahushua teaches in um, the book of the Nazarene, chapter 7, verses 7, and the PDF page is 70. So Nazarene 7, 7 says, While eating, Yahushua said, No man of himself can know right from wrong, for what is right in one man's eyes may be wrong in another's. Therefore strife arises among them. Only when men accept a single standard of judgment and abide by it can there be peace. When men live together without the light of the Torah, they are like a house built with unmortared bricks, or like men trying to tow a boat, but all pulling it in different directions. And so wise words and deeds, I I believe those came from our, our, our master, because I see this... Um, plainly living in a community where we all know and we all agree to abide by one uh, one directive here. And um, 
it is able to help us with mediations when things go wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, if someone doesn't want to abide by the Torah, well, then, you know, it makes things very, very simple. Um, but this is the one standard that we all uh, can be joined in. And so very thankful for that. Let's go on to chapter 25 of Leviticus, and we'll talk about the uh, the Jubilee, the Sabbath year, and the Jubilee year. Um, let's get over to it right now. Vaikra, Leviticus chapter 25. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Yasharel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto Yahuwah. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for Yahuwah. You shall neither sow your field, nor prune your vineyard. That which grows of its own accord of your harvest you shall not reap, neither gather the grapes of your vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be food for you, for you and for your servant, and for your maid, and for your hired servant, and for your stranger that sojourns with you, and for your cattle, and for the beasts that are in your land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. And you shall number seven Shabbatholt, Sabbaths of years unto you, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Shabbatholt of years shall be unto you forty and nine years. Then shall you cause the shofar of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in Yom Kippurim, the day of atonement, shall ye make the shofar sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hollow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which grows of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of your vine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. And if ye sell aught unto your neighbor, or buy aught of your neighbor's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, you shall buy of your neighbor. And according unto the number of years of the fruits, he shall sell unto you. According to the multitude of years, you shall increase the price thereof, and according to the fewness of years, you shall diminish the price of it. For according to the number of the years of the fruits, he sells unto you. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but you shall fear your Elohim, for I am Yahuwah Elohim. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes, and guard my judgments, and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit, and ye shall eat your fill, and dwell therein in safety. And if ye say, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow, nor gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And ye shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruits Okay, I don't know what happened. So praise yeah. Uh, so, so let's t start at Leviticus twenty five twenty two. And ye shall sow the eighth year and eat yet of the old fruit in the ninth year until her fruits come in. Ye shall eat of the old store. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. If your brethren be waxen poor and has sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it. Then shall he redeem that which is his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof, and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, that he may return unto his possession. 
But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that has bought it unto the year of the jubilee. And in the jubilee it shall go out, and he shall return unto his possession. And if a man sell a dwelling house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold. Within a full year may he redeem it. And if it be not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city shall be established forever to him that bought it throughout his generations. It shall not go out in the jubilee. But the houses of the villages which have no wall round about them shall be counted as the fields of the country. They may be redeemed, and they shall go out in the jubilee. Notwithstanding the cities of the Leviim and the houses of the cities of their possession, may the Leviim redeem at any time. And if a man purchase of the Leviim, then the house that was sold and the city of his possession shall go out in the year of the Jubilee. For the houses of the cities of the Leviim are their possession among the children of Yashrael. But the field of the suburbs of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession. And if your brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with you, then you shall relieve him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. Take no usury of him or increase, but fear your Elohim, that your brother may live with you. You shall not give him your money upon usury, nor lend him your victuals for increase. I am Yahweh Haikam, which brought you forth out of the land of Mitzrayim, to give you the land of Canaan, and to be your Elohim. And if your brother that dwells by you be waxen poor and be sold unto you, you shall not compel him to serve as a bondservant. But as a hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with you, and shall serve you unto the year of Jubilee. And then he shall depart from you, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family, and unto his own posse- and unto the possession of his fathers shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Mitzrayim. They shall not be sold as bondmen. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your Elohim. Both your bondmen and your bondmaids, which you shall have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them you shall buy bondmen and bondmaids." Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall you buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Yashrael, ye shall not rule one over another with rigor. And if a sojourner or a stranger wax rich by you, and your brother that dwells by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by you, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him, either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he is able, he may redeem himself. And he shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold unto him unto the year of Jubilee, and the price of his sale shall be according to the number of the years, according to the time of a hired servant shall it be with him. If there be yet many years behind, according unto him unto them, he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. And if there remain but a few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall count with him, and according unto his years shall he give him again the price of his redemption." And as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with rigor over him over him in your sight. And if he be not redeemed in these years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For unto me the children of Yashrael are servants. They are my servants whom I brought forth out of the land of Mitzrayim. I am Yahweh Elohim. So not really sure why the audio recording cut out earlier, but praise yeah. Uh, so Let's see. Um, let's. What do I want to talk, start out first? Let's go back to the year of release. So, this this is a hard concept for a lot of us to grasp because most of us, um, including me, you know, get uh, all or most of our crops from the store. Uh, most of us. Let's just let's be realistic. Most of us don't have farms. I know a lot of people are aspiring to do homesteads. Some people have even neat little gardens. They have a few things. But let's be realistic. Most of us are not living off of. Um, the uh, living an agrarian uh, lifestyle, as in living off the land, uh, a lot that's in a lot of our hearts, but realistically, that's not where a lot of us are. So this is hard to con- you know to have a con- to really conceptualize, really the trust and faith that the people in Yahuwah needed to have, because literally he's like, you work your land for six years, and the seventh you don't, and it's like, from a harvest standpoint, you're like, ooh, how do we keep doing that? But it's a test, right? Because if they had done this, he would have blessed them so much more, uh, specifically in the sixth year, you know, kind of like we said with the manna, he doubled up on, this, on the sixth year. 
Uh, but he's like, he goes on beyond that. You know, it's like, I'll give you for that year and even two more years. And it's like, it's, it, this is a, the lesson to be learned here is trust, right? And, and they had to trust him with their very basics, um, of, of, uh, of life. And unfortunately, uh, through Leviticus 26, the next chapter, which we'll read, uh, we'll, we find out that they, um, he prophesied that they would not do it. And, uh, Jeremiah said that, that they didn't do it. And, um, so yeah, second Chronicles, um, actually details that uh, they basically they go astray and it's uh, concluded uh, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah it's the word of Yahuwah by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate she kept Sabbaths to fulfill three score and ten years so uh, they did not keep them uh, and so you know I love this verse here Job thirteen fifteen. though he slay me so even if Yahuwah kills me yet will I trust in him but I will maintain mine own ways before him so it's like even though the worst thing can possibly happen, we will trust in him. Psalm 212, Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So we're blessed even for just trusting him. And consider it's not just the big life decisions. Sometimes it's a small day-to-day -day interactions. You know, we have the, the opportunity to either put our trust in him or not. And he's watching. Psalm 511, but let all those that put their trust in you rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let them also that love your name be joyful in you. Isaiah 26, 1 through 4, in that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will Elohim appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation, which keeps the truth, may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust ye in Yahuwah forever, for in Yahuwah is everlasting strength. Nehum 1.7, Yahuwah is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows them that trust in him. So we know that Yahushua says to many people, away from me, I never knew you. And we know that that's a direct connection to those that do not keep the commandments. But in general, he knows them that trust in him. Hallelujah. Sometimes, sometimes just the struggle to keep the commandment is a show of trusting him that I, I'm very familiar. Um, so trust really is is the is the big part here um, that we can glean. First Maccabees two, one of my favorite speeches here, the last words of Matthias. First Maccabees two forty nine through sixty four. Now the days drew near for Matthias to die, and he said to his sons, "Arrogance and reproach have now become strong." It is a time of ruin and furious anger. Now my children show zeal for the law, the Torah, and give your lives for the covenant of our fathers. Remember the deeds of our fathers, which they did in their generations, and receive great honor and an everlasting name. Was not Abraham found faithful when tested, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness? Joseph, in the time of his distress, kept the commandment and became master of Egypt. Phinehas, our father, because he was deeply zealous, received the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Joshua, because he fulfilled the command, became a judge in Israel. Caleb, because he testified in the assembly, received an inheritance in the land. David, because he was merciful, inherited the throne of the kingdom forever. Elijah, because of great zeal for the Torah, was taken up into heaven. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael believed and were saved from the flame. Daniel, because of his innocence, was delivered from the mouth of the lions, and so observed from generation to generation that none who put their trust in him will lack strength. Do not fear the words of a sinner. For his splendor will turn into a dung and worms. Today he will be exalted, but tomorrow he will not be found, because he has returned to the dust, and his plans will perish. My children, be courageous and grow strong in the Torah, for by it you will gain honor. So does he trust you? Another thing to consider. Luke sixteen ten through 13 He who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And he who is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve Elohim and mammon. So the question is, does he trust you? Consider when no one else is looking, right? When it's just, I mean, at all times he's looking, but I'm just saying, even when you think that no one's looking, and he's always looking. And does he, are you trustworthy? Ask yourself that. I don't know. Are you trustworthy in his eyes? 
Exodus 34, 21, six days shall you work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. So he's telling you right here, hey, 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 trust me, rest. And uh, we've learned from our creator that it is uh, so good for us. Hallelujah. Um, I do believe that the return of Yahusha will be on a jubilee. Uh, Isaiah 61 uh, shows us, at least to my understanding at this time, that he did come on uh, the acceptable year of Yahuwah, the, the jubilee year, uh, to do what? Uh, to preach good tidings to the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, freedom to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahuwah and the day of vengeance of our Elohim, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahuwah, that he might be glorified. And so, um, long story short, I believe, you know, Yahusha is coming back on a, um, a jubilee year. Uh, yeah, so, hallelujah. I hope that this is that year. Um, you know, it's interesting here that there's a special trumpet blown on the year of Jubilee. Uh, it's right. It's, then you should cause the shofar or the, the trumpet of Jubilee to sound. And, um, you know, the end starts with a shofar blast. We, we read this earlier um, in for, uh, Psalm 47. Elohim has gone up with a shout. Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet. You know, could that be the sounding of the, um, you know, the Jubilee year? Hmm. We already read this in First Thessalonians. No need to read it again. Uh, Revelation four one through two. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, which we want to enter, right? And the first voice which I heard, as it were of a trumpet, talking with me, saying, "Come up here, and I'll show you things which must be hereafter." And immediately I was on the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. This is, I believe, is the, a, a picture of the resurrection, and it begins with this uh, shofar blast. Is the jubilee year gonna going to announce that? Joel 2.15, blow the shofar in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of Yahuwah, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Yahuwah, and give not your heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their Elohim? Then will Yahuwah be jealous for his land and pity his people. Isaiah 27, 12 through 13 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall dwell, shall worship Yahweh in the holy mount at Yerushalayim, which I believe is the heavenly one, but uh, it's for another time. So um, let's... Let's see here. I think, what else do I have here? And, uh, you know, the concept here about letting an entire year rest. Um, consider that, you know, Yahusha also instructed us in a similar way, maybe more more applicable, applicable for our time. Um, I don't know what just happened here. Okay. I don't know why it's in a different language. English. That was wild. Okay. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I say to you, take no thought for your life, right? The basic necessities for life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat or fruit and the body more than clothing? Behold the fowls of the air, for they don't sow, neither do they reap, nor do they gather in barns. So he's like, they don't do farmer stuff, right? Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto a stature. None of us. I, I, I've thought of it. I, I, yeah, can't happen. And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if Elohim so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or with what shall we be clothed? For after these things do the nations seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have needed these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of Elohim and his righteousness, the Torah, right? And all these things shall be added to you. He's like, I'm going to give you these things and more. 
Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So no anxiety, no stress. Don't stress about it. And those of you that are continuously stressing about making ends meet, and maybe he's still trying to teach you a lesson of trust me. And maybe you can move past this test of having to be financially strapped all the time. Or maybe not. It's up to ya, right? It's up to ya and any one of us. Paul said that we need to be content with whatever position we're in, whether it's in plenty or whether it's, it's, in, it's in little, whether it's in, in, in uh, abundance or leanness. And we have to be grounded, rooted, settled, settled people uh, to be able to, to walk in whatever he's called us to. You know, it's one interesting concept about the, the, the year of Jubilee and how every 50 years there was a, basically like a reset. Um, the Jubilee process, if you actually follow this through, and if you actually applied it today right now, the Jubilee process eliminates the Monsantos and the other mega corporations who run the world. Um, it wouldn't allow them to grow that big. Uh, they can only grow so much in 50 years and then reset reset as far as you know when it comes to, to debts and and because uh, we know that a lot of these corporations a lot of these people are ruling through uh, through servitude through debt financial debt um, but that's not for here I'm not a debt and financial teacher so I'm not even gonna get further into that but the Jubilee process itself is beautiful in that it would actually eliminate that and I love Yahuwah for that so hallelujah um, and then Obviously, the, the whole part of this Jubilee process, um, you know, involves the kindness to poor, the poor, which obviously wouldn't wouldn't give place for like, giants like Monsanto's and even the Wally Worlds and things like that. Um, the, the, consider that the Jubilee is, is a release of debt, it's a release of, of slavery, it's a release of many things. Um, the lesson we can learn with each other right now is, you know, forgiveness. Even you know if, if even if one has wronged us, uh, you know we can forgive them from the heart. Surely the the Torah, the Torah and Messiah instructs us to go to one another to redeem these, to not redeem reconcile these things because we know that when things are not reconciled, they're hidden and 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 they compress or they they exasperate. They get worse and worse and worse to a point where someone just blows up over a little thing that could have been handled if if people were courageous enough to to confront one another. Um, so anyways, the point here is that we can, thinking of the Jubilee, we, we should always have a Jubilee mindset of being able to release uh, one, one another of, of, our, um, of our faults, of our wrongs one another. So, all right, let's go on to Leviticus 26, and here we go. Hopefully it works. If not, I'll just read it. Praise you. Vaikra, Leviticus chapter 26. Ye shall make you no idols, nor graven image. Neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall ye set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am Yahuwah Elohim. Ye shall guard my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary, I am Yahuwah. If ye walk in my statutes and guard my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season. And the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time. And ye shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, lying down with nothing to fear, and the Sabbath of life. Though evil be part of the land, there is no sword to bring in the land. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. And ye shall eat old store, and bring forth the old because of the new. And I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and will be your Elohim, and ye shall be my people. I am Yahuwah Elohim, which brought you forth out of the land of Mitzrayim, that ye should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bands of your yoke, and made you go upright. But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, 
so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant. I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning on, that shall consume the eyes, and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursues you. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron, and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. And if ye walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, and destroy your cattle, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if ye will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you, that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you, and ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. And if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places, and cut down your images, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. And I will make your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. And I will not smell the savor of your sweet odors. And I will bring the land unto desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw out my sword after you. And your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Shabbatholt, as long as it lies desolate, and ye be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest, and enjoy her Shabbatholt. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Shabbatholt, when ye dwelt upon it. And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts, in the land of their enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursues. And they shall fall one upon another, as it were before a sword, when none pursues. And ye have no power to stand before your enemies. And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity, in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their transgressions which they transgressed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised heart be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Yaakov, and also my covenant with Yitzhak, and also my covenant with Abraham, will I remember, and I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbathot, while she lies desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because even because they despised my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet, for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them. For I am Yahuwah Elohim. 
But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Mitzrayim, in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their Elohim. I am Yahuwah. These are the commandments and judgments and Torah, which Yahuwah made between him and the children of Yashrael in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moshe. All right, praise. Yeah, we're going to talk about Leviticus 26. And I got a couple notes on here. And then we're going to play 27 and finish up. I don't have a whole lot of notes for 27. So this is going to be really the last part we kind of go over, which 26 is a huge chapter. Um, and just in case you missed some of it, you know, Leviticus 26, 1 through 5, um, what I like about this, or not like, but what I recognize here is... Um, He's clear that this is a, a conditional prosperity. It's all if you walk in my statutes. Uh, it's uh, conditional. You do this, then I will. Um, and so, um, you know, you it's a it's an action and and, uh, reward and a consequence. In, in this case, a reward. And and it's really he makes it that simple. And you'll notice that you've got roughly uh, what thirteen verses of uh, instructions of blessings because that's really simple. And then. And then, then what? Forty something verses about the curses. You see the same thing in, in um, Deuteronomy twenty-eight, um, and just because life is is very simple when you uh, when you're in obedience, life is very simple, um, and there's shalom, there's peace. Whereas in with with disobedience, there's chaos, there's disorder, there's so much going on, so much to deal with, and that's why there's a lot more verses. Um, and this just goes back to what we learned with you know through Messiah, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. All the basics of life, you know, to 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 be fruitful, to to produce enough food, so you don't have to worry. Literally telling you here that you don't have to worry about the jubilee stuff I just told you about because if you keep my commandments, I'm gonna give you an extra. Right? He even says, "I'll have respect unto you." He says, "You shall eat the old store and bring forth the old because of the new." Uh, he's, there's going to be plenty to go around uh, if you just but take care of the poor and just all these kind of things. Anyways, uh, and so we, we find in even in the New Testament conditional statements, um, Colossians 1, 20 through 23, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled, praise you, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight, if, here it is, con- conditional statement, you know, condition, conditional requirements, if you con- continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So literally the entire thing about salvation is conditional if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. And that's this is and this is a, this is easier said than done because uh, I'd say a good handful of the people in this walk that understand this faith and obedience are not even keeled, are very wishy washy, very easily moved, easily swayed, a reed shaken with the wind, and so we've got to be firmer in 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 have our stance firmer on the the gospel of Messiah, the chief cornerstone, the the apostles, the foundation stones. And building upon that, what they've given us. Um, I've got a note here for verse 6, and I don't have anything to say. Yeah, I will give peace in the land, lying down with nothing to fear, and the Sabbath of life. Though evil be part of the land, there is no sword to bring it in. So literally, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, even if there's evil meaning, meaning people with big armies around you, it ain't going to happen. Forget about it. Forget about it. That's not going to happen, right? And then he says here, I will have respect unto you, Ooh, turn to us, face us. Uh, good stuff. Uh, Leviticus 16, uh, 26, 16. Uh, a couple of key words here. Uh, the consumption is a wasting disease of the lungs. And actually, during COVID, I kept thinking of this this scripture here. Like, you know, people are having this wasting disease of the lungs. Um, the burning ague is uh, fevers, um, sorrow of heart, of course, depression. You know, what are some of the things we see uh, that's consuming people these days and it's because literally they've they're separated from from elohim um what's interesting here in leviticus 26 24 it says then i'll also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins 
I'm going to do a quick uh, cover of this. Um, uh, in Ezekiel 4, 4 through 5, we see the actual timeline punishment for the house of Israel. It says, Lie also upon your left side, and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that you shall lie upon it, shall you bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon you the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days. So shall you bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So here's what's going on. So we have 390 years of punishment. However, since they walked contrary, he's punishing them seven times. So if you take 390 years times seven, you get 2,730 years. Now, why is that interesting? Well, the... Um, Northern House of Israel went into captivity starting around 721 BC. So if you take the time of punishment, which is 2,730 years, if you take from the time they went into captivity, 2000, fast forward 2,730 years, it gets to 2009, which is interesting because uh, from what we understand, some of the largest just out of the nowhere waking up of people to this truth uh, began right around that time. And uh, what's interesting also is they the the um, captivity started in 721 BC, but I mean it was a 10 year process, right? Uh, even longer for everyone to be fully deported and, and whatnot. And so um, you know it's interesting that people are coming in waves back into the truth, the house of Israel, as they were the opposite, as they were going into captivity in waves. Now they're coming out of captivity in waves. And this is not about a specific skin color or, or people. This is about the real house of Israel, the, the spiritual one, uh, those that are by the faith of Messiah Yahusha. And so kind of interesting here. Um, if we go to Leviticus 26-24, oh, we already talked about, uh, we talked about that, but just to recover really quickly uh, that punishment is good for us um, and Proverbs 12, 1 says, One who loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates rebuke is stupid. Hebrews 12, 7 through 8, It is for discipline that you endure. Elohim deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So we should we should encourage. And that's why David was bold to say, uh, search me, try my reins. And if there's any sin in me, you know, tell me. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but... Psalm 11971, it is good for me that I was afflicted so that I may learn your statutes. So hallelujah for an Elohim who punishes us for our own good. Praise yeah. And then uh, down here in uh, towards the end, verses 38 through 42, he's talking about, you know, when you're in the land of your enemies, um, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their father, which is a key point. Uh, we see this in Daniel. Uh, Daniel basically, in Daniel 9, he, he sets his face to f prayer and fasting, and uh, he basically he brings Leviticus 26 to mind, uh, confessing his fa uh, his, the faults of him and his fathers, and uh, he repents, right? And so basically, Daniel rightly understands Leviticus 26, 38 through 42, which says that we must confess our iniquity and the iniquity of our fathers. So this is something that I've done and I've encouraged others to do. If you have not confessed the iniquity of your fathers, hopefully all of you here listening here have confessed your iniquity. Um, and if you have not, this is the time. Oh, there's, uh, there's no better time than right now to get on your knees and confess your iniquity before the Most High, not before a priest in a box, uh, not before me or anyone, before your Heavenly Father, all right? And also the iniquity of your fathers. You know, let's do it together. I, I, I want to, maybe I just give an example. Heavenly Father, Yahweh Most High, just come before you in Yahushua's name. And Father, I just want to confess my sins before you, Father, and I want to confess the sins of my fathers, those before me who have, have brought us to this place, Father. Just pray you'd forgive us in the name of Yahushua. Amen. Hallelujah. It's very simple, you know, and, and of course there can be there can be more details uh, about your own, you know, your own sins to him, like what you've done. Maybe you even know some of the sins of your fathers and what what they have done. Uh, maybe you, some of you know that. Uh, and then this is part of, I believe, also getting rid of the generational curses. I don't think you have to see some specialist that has to go over like a a forty five point checklist of all the things that you renounced. I think it's right here. This is generational curses released right here. You confess your iniquity and the iniquity of your fathers. That's it, right? That is what the Most High asks you to do. Men have added all sorts of fluff to it, and no more. None of that. 
Confess your iniquity and the iniquity of your fathers. Praise the Most High. So, like I said, and you know, if you want some more guidance, read Daniel nine. I have the the link here in the, the in the uh, notes. But, um, anyways, uh, we're gonna let uh, we're gonna let actually uh, Leviticus twenty seven play, and then I have one little uh, snippet from the prayer of Manasseh to uh, play, and we'll uh, finish up the book of Leviticus. So, I'll be back with y'all in just a moment. Praise the Most High Elohim. Vaikra, Leviticus chapter twenty seven. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Yashiro, and say unto them, When a man shall make a singular vow, the persons shall be for Yahuwah by your estimation. And your estimation shall be of the male from twenty years old, even unto sixty years old. Even your estimation shall be fifty shekels of silver, after the shekel of the sanctuary. And if it be a female, then your estimation shall be thirty shekels. And if it be from five years old, even unto twenty years old, then your estimation shall be of the male twenty shekels, and for the female ten shekels. And if it be from a month old, even unto five years old, then your estimation shall be of the male five shekels of silver, and for the female your estimation shall be three shekels of silver. And if it be from sixty years old and above, if it be a male, then your estimation shall be fifteen shekels, and for the female, ten shekels. But if he be poorer than your estimation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall value him according to his ability, that vowed shall the priest value him. And if it be a beast, whereof men bring an offering unto Yahuwah, all that any man gives of such unto Yahuwah shall be holy. He shall not alter it, nor change it, a good for a bad, or a bad for a good. And if he shall at all change beast for beast, then it and the exchange thereof shall be holy. And if it be any unclean beast, of which they do not offer a sacrifice unto Yahuwah, then he shall present the beast before the priest. And the priest shall value it, whether it be good or bad, as you value it. Who are the priest, so shall it be. But if he will at all redeem it, then he shall add a fifth part thereof unto your estimation. And when a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto Yahuwah, then the priest shall estimate it, whether it be good or bad, as the priest shall estimate it so shall it stand. And if he that sanctified it will redeem his house, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of your estimation unto it, and it shall be his. And if a man shall sanctify unto Yahuwah some part of a field of his possession, then your estimation shall be according to the seed thereof. A omer of barley seed shall be valued at fifty shekels of silver. If he sanctify his field from the year of Jubilee, according to your estimation, it shall stand. But if he sanctify his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon unto him the money according to the years that remain, even unto the year of Jubilee, and it shall be abated from your estimation. And if he that sanctified the field will in any wise redeem it, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of your estimation unto it, and it shall be assured to him. And if he will not redeem the field, or if he have sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed any more. But the field, when it goes out in the jubilee, shall be holy unto Yahuwah. As a field devoted, the possession thereof shall be the priests. And if a man sanctify unto Yahuwah a field which he has bought, which is not of the fields of his possession, then the priest shall reckon unto him the worth of your estimation, even unto the year of the jubilee. And he shall give your estimation in that day as a holy thing unto Yahuwah. In the year of the jubilee, the field shall return unto him of whom it was bought, even to him to whom the possession of the land did belong. And all your estimation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twenty geras shall be the shekel. Only the firstling of the beasts, which should be Yahuwah's firstling, no man shall sanctify it, whether it be ox or sheep, it is Yahuwah's. And if it be of an unclean beast, 
and he shall redeem it according to your estimation, and shall add a fifth part of it thereto. Or if it be not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to your estimation. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto Yahuwah of all that he has, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto Yahuwah. None devoted, which shall be devoted of men, shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is Yahuwah's. It is holy unto Yahuwah. And if a man shall at all redeem aught of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd, or of the flock, even of whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto Yahuwah. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which Yahuwah commanded Moshe for the children of Yashrael in Mount Sinai. Okay, so if you didn't uh, quite pick it up here, the the priesthood was also the the banking system. There was no uh, <laughs> there was no uh, Federal Reserve or any of those kind of things. It was, Yahuwah's priests um, were in the temple, right? They were in charge of all that. So, anyways, um, let's read really quickly the prayer of Manasseh together because great is the mercy of Yahuwah. Prayer of Manasseh. This was in the Apocrypha. Um, oh. Yahuwah Almighty, El Shaddai, the Elohim of our fathers, of Abraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov, you know, and of their righteous posterity, you who have made heaven and earth with all their order, who has shackled the sea by your word of command, who has confined the deep and sealed it with your terrible and glorious name, at whom all things shudder and tremble before your power, for your glorious splendor cannot be borne, and the wrath of your threat to sinners is irresistible. Yet immeasurable and unsearchable is your promised mercy, for you are Yahweh Most High of great compassion, long-suffering, and very merciful, and repent over the evils of men. You, O Yahweh, according to your great goodness, have promised repentance and forgiveness to those who have sinned against you, and in the multitude of your mercies you have appointed repentance for sinners, that they may be saved. Therefore you, O Yahweh, Elohim of the righteous, has not appointed repentance for the righteous, for Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, who did not sin against you, but you have appointed repentance for me, who am a sinner. For the sins I have committed are more in number than the sand of the sea. My transgressions are multiplied, O Yahweh, they are multiplied. I am unworthy to look up and see the height of heaven because of the multitude of my iniquities. I am weighed down with many of an iron fetter, so that I am rejected because of my sins, and I have no relief. For I have provoked your wrath, and I have done what is evil in your sight, setting up abominations and multiplying offenses. And now I bend the knee of my heart, beseeching you for your kindness. I have sinned, O Yahweh, I have sinned. And I know my transgressions. I earnestly beseech you, forgive me, O Yahweh, forgive me. Do not destroy me with my transgressions. Do not be angry with me forever or lay up evil for me. Do not condemn me to the depths of the earth. For you, O Yahweh, are the Elohim of those who repent. And in, in me you will manifest your goodness. For unworthy as I am, you will save me in your great mercy. And I will praise you continually all the days of my life. For all the hosts of heaven sings your praise, and your glory is forever. Amen. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. Well, this is the end of uh, Vaikra Leviticus. I um, uh, just wanted a couple announcements. Uh, praise Yah. Sukkot was amazing. Hallelujah. Um, just, it was so good. I, I might talk a little about it a little more next week. I know this is kind of a longer one. Um, just want to give Yah praise. Um, you know, I shared with you guys weeks ago that the computer was going down. Uh, Yah has provided uh, um, a whole new uh, computer system. Uh, so hallelujah. Um, praise Yah. Uh, also, uh, and by the way, um, it looks like I've been in the sun way too long. I, I, this is a whole new setup, and so I don't. I have to fix the colors, but I, my face is not completely burnt like this. <laughs> it looks like my face is on fire. I just I didn't have time to mess with all the stuff but anyways also uh praise be to yah he provided also again in another big way um 
the the day of Sukkot um, before it started that night, uh, we we signed the uh, the paperwork and uh, closed uh, on uh, a new property uh, right next to ours, the the adjoining property, which is going to be enough room for us to build and and uh, create a uh, our own campground, so we can do the feast days on our own land and um, not have to spend tens of thousands of dollars renting uh, other campgrounds to do Yahweh's feast days. So uh, he's moving and. Uh, uh, I'll be I'll be excited to share with you the progress of um, uh, working the land and uh, and uh, rear and uh, getting it uh, ready for the feast days. So our goal is to get it ready for Sukkot 2025. Of course, if we're still here, yeah, willing. Um, I'm also uh, super super okay with him coming back, uh, like right now. <laughs> so um, baby Josiah is doing really well. He had a great first Sukkot. Um, yeah, he's good, brothers and sisters. He is really good. And um, I'm thankful for the affliction. I'm th I'm thankful um, that Yahweh afflicted me, that I might learn His statutes. So, hallelujah. Let's pray, and we'll jump off here. How Father Yahweh Most High, we, we love you. We thank you. Uh, we want to offer our lives to you, all of it, Father. Help us to be better servants to you, and help us to diligently seek you out. Give us, give us a heart. Give us zeal. Give us fervor in our heart, Father, to, to search you out with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and to... Uh, to rear up our families in righteousness, O Yahuwah, that you'd guide us, you'd be with us, and we just, we love you. We thank you for all your Shabbats, your feast days. We thank you for instruction, but we thank you f mostly for sending your son, Yahusha, who we love and want to follow with all of our heart. It's in his name we pray, and in your name also, Yahuwah Sabaot. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll do a song, um, and uh, let's see. Let's go with... Um, This one is not working. When I'm feeling low. Struggle just to cope When I'm feeling like I failed And I start to lose my hope When stressful times come like a gale And the storm is shaking my bones Weary from just wandering And I wonder if you knows I call upon your name Cause you're faithful in the highs and lows well, I need you, yeah To hold me close To strengthen me when I'm at of my own bunny do yeah to hold me close as the darkness surrounds I know you'll never let me go oh yeah will you hold me close Mockers at my door, and the enemy boasts when the devil sets his snare, and the fallen not come close when the world is selling me lies, and I don't want to forfeit my. Turn away from it all Only to Yah will I hold I call upon your name Cause you're faithful in the highs and lows well, I need you, Yah To hold me close To strengthen me when I
my Elohim is good And I have made him my refuge That I may tell of all your works, O oh, yeah. As for me, the newness of my Elohim is good, and I have made him my refuge, that I may tell of all your works, oh yeah. Last for Surrounds, I know you'll never let me go. Oh, yeah.